Hello, and welcome to this conference hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. I'm your host, Bavia Suri, the health educator for MS Focus, and I'm joined by Dr. Flavia Nelson, who will be talking to us about the latest in stem cell transplant. After the presentation, we'll open it up to your questions and comments. And now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker. Dr. Flavia Nelson is a board certified neurologist specializing in multiple sclerosis and other neuroimmunologic disorders. After receiving her medical degree from the University of Chihuahua, I'm so sorry, I'm gonna pronounce that wrong, in Mexico, Dr. Nelson completed a residency in internal medicine at Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center. Additionally, she completed a neurology residency and a clinical research fellowship in MS with the Multiple Sclerosis Research Group at the University of Texas Medical School in Houston. Dr. Nelson continued her work with the University of Texas and went on to become the interim director of the Multiple Sclerosis Research Group at the UT Health Sciences Center at Houston, where she co-directed the MRI Analysis Center. Currently, she's a professor of neurology and director of the Neuroimmunology Division and the MS Center of Excellence at the University of Miami in Florida. Dr. Nelson serves as both a member and as a leader in several organizations related to multiple sclerosis and neurology. She is a trailblazer in research related to the imaging of the cortical gray matter lesions in multiple sclerosis and correlation with cognitive impairment. More recently, her interest expanded to stem cell transplant in MS and she has written multiple research publications and been a part of numerous clinical trials relating to her specialty. We're very pleased to have her join us to present this important topic today. Dr. Nelson, thank you for being with us and I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Sue. I'm gonna share my screen with all of you and um, please let me know if you can see it, okay? Okay, how's everyone doing today? Thank you for joining. Um, I'm gonna try to go to the slides relatively quickly. We have 48 slides, but I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on each. And uh, I wanna try to stick to 30 minute presentation and then give at least 15 minutes uh, for questions and answers, but if we go over the 15 minutes, you know, we, we have until five. I just, I know it's a Friday and people want to probably start their weekend. So, um, let's see. I don't have any conflicts of interest that would affect this presentation and so this is just a quick recap of the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis. And you know we know that this is the blood brain barrier. And like I usually tell my patients, this is like a, a customs right across, right in between the border between the US and Mexico. And it's, you know, it's really tight. It doesn't let anything get through, but some of the B cells and T cells that were activated in the periphery to attack the brain and the spinal cord do get through. So, you know, that's those T cells and B cells, which are the main members of the immune system are gonna cross in, from the blood into the blood brain barrier. And that because they're pre-programmed to attack, they, that's what they're gonna do. So, you know, what, what we do with the medications is kill them in the periphery or block them from entering the brain and the spinal cord, depending on which medication you are on. So again, as we, you, I'm sure you've learned these terms or heard these terms before, uh, most people start with relapse and remitting MS, which has relapses and, and remission. Some people have progressive disease alone, which is primary progressive. And some people have progressive relapsing, which means most of the time they are progressing, but they've had maybe one or two relapses in their whole life. And, and then if we take 100 people and we don't treat them, or say we take 10 people and we don't treat them at all, um, 
we're going to show, we're going to have eight of them develop secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. But as again, this is untreated. And nowadays with the treatments that we have, we know that we're decreasing this number, right? Where it's no longer eight out of 10 people will develop secondary progressive MS. We're changing that, but it's difficult to measure because we cannot take uh, 10 people or say a hundred people and treat half and not treat the other half and follow them 30 years later and see what happened. That would be unethical. So, but we know that these numbers are in some groups that we we were able to follow for at least five, six, seven years, we know these numbers are going from 50% to 30%. And I think if we could measure them now, they will be even better. So that's what I was just uh, mentioning. Now, this is a little bit uh, complicated, but it's just a point to, to make a point I want to make that we're moving away from calling it relapsing remitting or secondary progressive or primary progressive. So Dr. Lovelin from Mount Sinai in New York proposed a different way of talking about it. And it's just about whether it is um, active or not active, okay? Um, or progressive, also active or not active. So it's either MS, relapsing MS, active or not active, or progressive MS, active or not active. And so we're gonna start, we're gonna start saying those terms as opposed to you have relapsing remitting or you have secondary progressive or you have progressive, but we're not quite there yet. It's just, it's coming. Okay, that's the wrong thing. Excuse me. Okay, so. I'm sure you're all familiar with how expensive medications for MS are, you know, and this 65,000 a year was a few years back in 2019. Now they're all around 100,000, if not more, right? And we have a new term that some of you may be familiar with, which is NIDA. NIDA stands for no evidence of disease activity, meaning this is our goal, for all neurologists and MS experts, this is our goal. We want no disability progression, no relapses, and no new or enlarging lesions on MRI, right? That's why we get an MRI, because we want to make sure that the lesions are as stable as you are telling us you feel on the outside. Uh, and the problem with this NIDA is that it's very difficult to maintain. It's, it's not so hard to achieve and it can be sustained for two years, three years, five years. But at some point, we, we start noticing either somebody had a new lesion or somebody had a little bit of worsening progression. So the bottom line is most patients uh, don't reach NIDA or they don't maintain NIDA for more than, than two years. Or, and then if, if we keep following them, it's only 18% after four years. So we need better treatments, right? We need treatments that can sustain NIDA or no evidence of disease activity, which will equal what we understand for remission. We want full remission. So here's again, different cost of the DMTs. We have generic Copaxone, Ocrelizumar or Ocrevus, Extavia, Interferon, Abajo, which is teraflunomide, Pysabri, which is natalizumab, Gilenia, which is fingolimod, and now we have new, new Gilenias, which are Mesent and uh, Zebosia, which are similar in price. Tecfidera or dimethyl fumarates and all the generics. Revif, which some people still use. Copaxon, that uh, also some people still use. And Lemtrata, which is used to be the most expensive one. Now, not only do we have the cost of the medication, which is very high, right? Up to 100, around 100,000 a year just for the medication. But when people develop disability, the, the cost of the disease is, is, is higher. And you know, you, you know this better than I do. So if people have mild to moderate disability, maybe it's about 30,000 a year between other medications for symptoms and plus, you know, an hospitalization, maybe physical therapy. 
Then once they start walking with assistance, then it goes to 50,000 a year. And then if things get worse and, um, and we have to, and patients have to depend on a wheelchair or a bed, then it's up to you know, more than 100,000 a year, which is, which is significant, it's very high compared to many diseases. So is the answer a stem cell transplant? Well, we will find out, right? The, the thing about undergoing a stem cell transplant is that you will have a transplant and then the expectation is that after the transplant, you will not need any disease modifying therapy, okay? And so that's why it's proposed as a solution or as a, a better option in the patients that are eligible or um, qualified. So how does that work? It's, it's a lot more complicated than people think. I get a lot of patients asking about a stem cell transplant, but they're not easy. They, they can be very hard on people and, and they can be a lot of complications from it. So what happens with most of the transplants, and this is just an example, but there are different types, okay? This is the, the, the regimen that uh, one of the transplant, stem cell transplant trials is, is doing, the most famous stem cell transplant these days, which is called the BEAT-MS, and we will talk a little bit more about it, uh, is exactly what happens. So that's why I, I wanted to show you this. So patient comes into the hospital, and they get chemotherapy and GCSF. So cyclophosphamide is chemotherapy. GCSF is, is uh, something that stimulates the growth of the stem cells, right? So they get both, which means we're gonna kill the cells that are circulating, and then we're gonna stimulate the bone marrow to make new ones, right? When that happens, so, here we give the cyclophosphamide, and then we give the GCSF, the cells die, and then they start growing back. At that point, we take them out, we uh, extract them from the body, you know, with a, uh, like you're getting blood, a blood drawn, and then we, we freeze it, we put it away. It's a, called cryopreservation of the HACT graph. So remember, these are new cells, First, we kill the old ones, most of them that are in the periphery. Then we give you this stimulant to make new cells grow from the bone marrow. Then when they come out in the bloodstream, we take them away, we put them in the freezer, and then we give you even more chemotherapy, really, really harsh chemotherapy. And that's going to finish killing the rest of the immune system that was still circulating. And, okay, So this was mild, but this is very, very strong. It's going to make people very sick. They're going to be in the hospital. And we keep the patient in the hospital once they get this regimen of BEAM, which is four different kinds of chemotherapeutic agents, just once, not more than once. It's not like chemotherapy when people have cancer and they go every month or every three weeks or every, depending on the cancer, you know, it's different regimens. This is just a one-time thing but you will be very sick. You will be in the hospital, very, very prone to infections and other complications. And so we have, we have to give you, and by the way, these lines over here, they're showing you your, your cells, your white blood cell count, right? The, black, the white blood cell count is basically what represents the immune system. So we can see here that they're around here, which is normal range. And once we give the chemotherapy, they're gone right? There's nothing, no circulating white blood cells. And we keep you in the hospital while you're here, while you, your cells are completely gone. And we give you antivirals, antifungals, everything that we can to protect you from an infection. And then eventually when your cells are starting to recover, we uh, say, you know, we still keep you in the hospital a little longer, or sometimes they are, people are discharged home, depending on the, on the, um, on the criteria that, that each clinical trial has, but that you are gonna spend a good amount, at least two to four weeks in the hospital. Then you're gonna go home. Your cells are gonna be in a better place, but you're still gonna to have to be very, very careful with infections, very, very careful with exposure to plants and fruits and you know everything that could potentially bring you a virus or a bacteria. And you're gonna be very weak. 
a lot of nausea, your hair is going to fall out, you know, the, all of those things is, is not, it's not an easy process. Um, so then what happens? So this is just a representation of what I just told you, right? We, we do the ablative conditioning, which was the first chemo. We destroyed all the cells that are circulating, right? Then we take those, those new cells that started coming out of the bone marrow, we take them out, right? And then these cells, uh, after the transplant, we're gonna see that these cells are different than the ones before the transplant. And then one year later, we see that the new cells, again, when we check on them, they're completely different. It's a new and diverse immune repertoire. It's like you got a, a, a different immune system that is not necessarily pre-programmed to attack your brain and your spinal cord. And that's the goal. It doesn't always happen. And that's one of the things we're gonna talk about in a minute. Uh, in theory, it will be 100% effective for everyone. It doesn't happen. It's like every drug that we have is not perfect, right? So even if you go through all of what we just talked about, which is not easy, um, it, we still have the risk of it not being a permanent treatment that, that creates that forever remission that we want, but it can. So, so again, what we're doing is resetting the immune system. So the patient immune system is decimated after collection, so it will rebuild. And when it reconstitutes, both of the T and B cells are gonna be new and they're gonna reestablish self-tolerance. Self-tolerance means those cells are not gonna attack that body because they weren't supposed to in the first place, right? B cells and T cells are your army. They're supposed to defend you against micro, microbes, bacteria, viruses, fungi, all of that, they're not supposed to attack you. So hopefully by, you know, the goal is that with, with, the, uh, with the transplant, we are creating a new database, right? So it has been shown that the targets for the T cell receptors are different and more diverse compared to the database prior to the procedure. So we know that is the case. And we think it's re, um, due to reactivation of the thymus, which is a gland that we have in our chest, you know, that, that um, is supposed to, to help um, activate T cells, but the balance goes again to naive T cells. Naive T cells meaning they are waiting to be told what their job is and not activated to attack your brain or your spinal cord. So, um, in this way, the mature memory of lymphocytes no longer includes the self-destructive targets that produce the autoimmune disease. So that, again, is the goal, and I hope this is clear. But if you have any questions, please write them down, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about it afterwards. So most autoimmune diseases, is, and, and this has been shown in MS, they have a deficiency in T regulatory cells regulatory as their word uh, as their name says it they regulate the rest of this immune system so if you don't have enough regulatory cells then these ones are going to go crazy and, are, and do things they're not supposed to right but when we reactivate the thymus with the transplant apparently these regulatory t cells show up again and they start controlling traffic and these bad b cells and t cells that misbehave before start behaving because we create new regulatory T cells, okay? So this is the, uh, the um, publication of the very first uh, study, multicenter study of hematopoietic stem cell transplant. So when you see this HSCT, that means hematopoietic from the blood stem cell transplant. And this is done with your own cells, which means it's autologous. So when, when you're getting a transplant from someone else, it's not autologous. Autologous means it's, these are your own cells or your own tissue, depending on what we're transplanting. And DMT, as some of you may know, stands for disease modifying therapy. So this was the very first trial that compared HACT versus disease modifying therapy and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the name Richard Burt, 
right? So we know about Dr. Richard Burt. He used to be um, in um, Northwest at Northwestern University in Chicago and very well known for the trial. A lot of people wanted to participate, but these trials, because they're research, they have very, very um, tight criteria, inclusion criteria, so not everybody qualifies for it. And the reason I put this arrow here is because I want you to see that my name is on this paper. Now, most of these people were from other places in the world. So Richard Burt's site was the only site in the United States. Aside from that site, there was one in Canada, one in England, one in Brazil, and one in uh, Sweden. Uh, at some point, he dropped the, the site in Canada. Why? Because the, uh, there was a, a, a patient that was enrolled that did not meet criteria. And so he decided that he didn't want to go through another issue like that. And so the Canada site was, was uh, taken out of the trial. And at the end, there were only four sites. And so this, again, this was the very first trial that was multi-center global, meaning all over the world, and the first one that compared HACT versus disease-modifying therapy. Started in 2011, and it was published in 2019. So what did they see? This, is, this was also called the MIST trial. In the first year, they saw that 36 patients, or 69% of the 52 patients, had relapsed, the ones that were in the disease-modifying therapy group, compared to only one of the 51 patients who relapsed in the HACT group. So it's a big deal, right? 69% in the DMT group had a relapse versus only one person, 2% of the ones that underwent HACT. Now, here's something that we hardly ever see when you're on a disease-modifying therapy or a, a MS medication, and that is the EDSS score. This is a disability score that we use in clinical trials to quantify disability. And in the HACT group, it went from 3.3 to 2.3. So when the, when the score goes down, that's good. If, if the score goes up, that's not good. So the higher the score, the more disability people have. And so when we looked at the DMT group in the first year, uh, the score, worsened for the DMT group from 3.3 to 3.98, almost four, as opposed to improved from 3.3 to 2.3. So big difference, right? So also, what about disease progression? So that means the disease is getting worse independent of a relapse. So you can get worse because you had a relapse and you didn't improve, or you can get worse because in between relapses, you just got worse and it didn't have anything to do with the relapse. And that's more difficult to control. And so there was disease progression in three patients in the HACT group and 34 patients in the DMT group. What else did they measure? The time 25 foot walk, which means, and I'm sure some of you have done it in the clinic, we're gonna have you walk 25 feet and we're gonna time you, right? And so in the DMT group, it went from five and, and 5.6 seconds at baseline, meaning before the, when the study started or when the patient was enrolled in the study, I should say, to almost eight, as opposed to the HACT group in which it went from 6.4 to six. So they were walking faster in the HACT group as opposed to slower in the um, DMT group. Fortunately, there were no deaths during the study, as you may have uh, heard or maybe you've done your research. There are a lot of studies in HACT that were a single center study. You know, some centers in Canada did their own studies. You know, many places did a study just at that site. That's why it's not a multi-center study like this one. And more, a lot of those studies especially earlier in, in, you know, in the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, they had some deaths. And so that's why people that were very reluctant to use HACT because it can, it can cause severe complications. And in this trial, there were no deaths and there were no patients that experienced significant 
grade four toxicities, meaning they were so sick. Uh, it's a complication without reaching death, but it was, you know, it's, it's one of those complications that you don't want to have. So the goal was to see how long it will take people in the HACT have a relapse as opposed to the people in the disease modifying therapy. So this was the, the this is the main measure. How long does it take these patients to have a relapse? And how long does it take these patients to have a relapse? So as you can see, it, the lines are very, very different, right? It took them a lot longer. And the numbers of patients that had a relapse, here is less than 20 patients. And here you can see uh, a lot more, a percentage, I'm sorry, less than 20%. And here you see up to 80% eventually at month 60, you know, it was up to 80% had had a relapse. And at month 60, only about 20% had had a relapse. So you can see there's a huge difference. Um, I'm not going to answer questions at the moment, but please write them down and I'll be happy to talk about it when, we, when we're done with the presentation, okay? Uh, unless there's a problem with the, you know, it, let us know if there's a problem, if there's something you cannot see, but if it's just a regular question, we'll take them at the end. Okay, so oh, I think I skipped one. So this is time to disease progression. So the previous one was time to relapse, time to disease progression, meaning when did we start seeing these people get worse gradually without a relapse? And you can see again that up to 60 months, we had less than 20, like about 10% of the patients and very few in the first 36 months, as opposed to based on DMT, right? There were lots of progression even at year one. And this trial, by the way, lasted 60 months. It's just the first numbers I gave you were from year one. Now, here we go. Let's talk about by year. What was the disease progression by year? And disease progression is important because we don't have a good handle on progression. You, all, you know that we have a good handle and the medications are very good about treating inflammation and relapses. Progression is a little bit more difficult. So by year, um, and these are numbers that perhaps are a little bit difficult to understand, but basically it, it was the, the proportion of patients with disease progression for the HACT group was very little, 1.259 at four and five years, as opposed to 24, 54, 62, 71, and 75 at five years. So big difference, right? And this is a different, different um, graph from different studies. So the previous one is, this is Dr. Bird's study, and this is uh, Dr. Muraro, who is the principal investigator of the, well, one of them, of the BEAT-MS trial. And they have different numbers because dif these are different studies and um, multiple studies combined. But we again see that here they separated by primary progressive, secondary progressive, and relapsing and by age, and they all progressed. There were very few with progression-free survival. So in these particular studies, I, I don't think they, the results were as good as in the previous one. But again, these are 25 centers, multiple studies, and just kind of all analyzed in the same as a group. Um, so MRI outcomes, this is my group at University of Minnesota where we were doing MRI research in a 10.5 Tesla and seven Tesla. And um, I like that picture. So anyway, so go back, let's go back to MRI results. MRI is important, right? Because it's also telling us what's happening. What's happening It's a window into what's going on in your brain that sometimes if we didn't have MRI, we wouldn't know that you may be having disease activity or that you may be more stable than we think. So the MIS trial was the first to incorporate centralized MRI analysis that included measuring T2 lesion volume rather than just looking at lesion numbers. And this is where my, this is what my role was. Uh, 
I'm a, as you heard, my, I'm an MRI expert and our group in Houston was doing the MRI analysis, quantifying the volume of T2 lesions and see what happens before and after. So when we looked at the MRIs, we, see, we saw that in the HACT arm, the, the average T2 lesion volume decreased. It actually decreased, which is unheard of in most clinical trials, by 24.4% at month six and by 317 at year one, compared with pre-baseline or pre-HACT baseline. And in the, in the DMT arm, the T2 lesion volume, meaning the amount of T2 lesions, increased by 29% from baseline and at month six and by 34% at year one. So it was the first reported significant decrease in T2 lesion volume in a phase three clinical trial. I wanna show you some pictures to see how incredible this was to just watch. So this is a patient number one. You see all these white spots. Oh, I'm sorry. All these white spots over here, right? This is the brain before HACT. This is at a different level, different level. And you can see a lot of lesions everywhere, right? Lots of spots. Now, this is after HACT, five years after, not right away, but five years after. You can see how this MRI looks almost at the exact same level as this, right? And this one as this, and this as this. How do we know? Because this is the middle of the brain. These spaces in the middle of the brain look the same, which means we're looking at the brain at the same level. And look at the amount of lesions that we see before the transplant, and look at the amount of lesions that we see after the transplant. I, I couldn't believe it myself when I saw this, uh, and uh, we actually analyze the data in two different ways to make sure because it was so unbelievable. And um, it was just very impressive. It didn't happen to everyone, but it, you know we had a lot of cases that had a decrease, a significant decrease. Uh, here's another one. Okay, this is still the same patient at different levels. Okay, so this patient had an incredible response and look at this MRI, how clean it looks compared to before. HACT, there was a reduction in T2 lesion volume of 74.4% five years post HACT. And then uh, this is patient number two. Again, a lot of lesions. This is an important area where you know it affects your memory. This is the brainstem, which this is the pons part of the brainstem, which controls your, your breathing and your heart rate and your eyes and and look at it after HACT. You can see this is at the same level because you see the eyes, you see the brainstem. Everything else looks the same except for these huge white spots that cover almost the entire brainstem at this level. And these kind of lesions in the brainstem can cause a lot of disability, more than some of these big lesions in an area that is not as functional such as this area. So this lesion is probably not going to give you any symptoms, but these ones, it's going to cause these lesions in this area are going to cause significant disability. But look at this, this brainstem now. So very impressive. Here's another one. This patient, patient number three, has a little more advanced MS. How do I know that? Just looking at the MRI, because these spaces are bigger, right? When you look at these spaces here. This is a younger person, right? And we know that as we age, we lose brain volume. And by when we lose brain volume, these spaces in the middle of the brain get larger. So as we age, we lose brain volume, all of us. But with MS, the brain ages faster. So the brain volume shrinks faster with MS. And usually when people have these spaces like this enlarge, these are called the ventricles and they're full of fluid. When these are enlarged and there's a lot of lesions around it that seem to be confluent, meaning you don't see one lesion, independent lesion, you see big white spots 
because all the lesions kind of came together, this usually speaks to someone that has had the disease for some time. And very often when you look at a brain of, of a patient with progressive disease, uh, especially secondary progressive, they're gonna have these confluent lesions. So you can expect that someone with more advanced disease is gonna, with, in someone that has more advanced disease, it's gonna be a little more difficult to decrease the lesion volume. So, but you can see that it did decrease to a certain degree. And even though the reduction was only 37, 37%, it was still was better than what it was before. So this is only two years post transplant, there was a significant increase in reduction in the T2 lesion volume. And some patients, you know, did not return to get an MRI five years later. So uh, that's sometimes what happens. People are like thinking, I'm doing really well. My MRIs look great. You know, I'm not going to come back. I, I'm just, I'm happy. Or, you know, it happens all day. Or they moved and, or they couldn't travel or whatever. So uh, we didn't have follow-up, five-year follow-up on everyone. And here's again, nine months pre-HACT. This is a patient that had a lot of enhancements. As you know, when, when we give you contrast and this lesion lights up with a contrast, that means this lesion is inflamed at the time of the MRI, right? So look at this huge lesion here and how when they give contrast to this patient, it was really bright. And then this one was also bright and this one was also bright. These ones were not bright. Why? Because these are older and they're not inflamed at the time of the MRI. That inflammation tends to last six weeks or so, right? But the scarring, these scars are gonna, are gonna stay there. The inflammation may go away within six weeks, stem cell transplant or no stem cell transplant, but the scar usually stays. It may get a little smaller, but it usually stays. And that was a really big scar with a lot of damage. Now look at three years and five years post HACT. Okay, so significant, significant improvement. Now in this patient, we do see that there was some shrinkage of the brain. It looks a little bit larger than in these slides or in these pictures. And so it could be that, you know, we, we cannot reduce brain volume loss on everyone. Um, we haven't done the analysis on brain volume, but you know that that is something that is going to be looked at in the current HACT trial, which we'll speak about uh, coming up. So again, another one, and here's the T2 lesion volume measures, and we can see significant improvement. Now, what were the adverse events? More, more common, upper respiratory tract infections, urinary tract infections, varicella zoster. Uh, this is a one idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, which can be dangerous because you can bleed, but it can be picked up very easily. And there were also complications in the DMT group. So there was also 0.19 in the HACT group versus 0.23 in the DMT group. So the DMT group actually had a little more infections, but that's typical of some of the um, disease modifying therapies, okay? So I'm gonna skip this only because we don't really need to worry about this. We already talked about NIDA. And then I just want you to know that, that the, um, we do have a position statement this, this says that you know the, the American Society for Blood and Bone Marrow Transplantation and a panel of experts convened to review the available evidence and make recommendations on MS as an indication for HACT. So what they said in 2019 is that based on available evidence, the ASPMT recommends the treatment refractory relapsing MS with high risk for future disability be considered as standard of care clinical evidence available indication for HACT. Unfortunately, we're still not doing it for everyone. It's still just part of research. And this is the current clinical trial. I know I'm, I'm, I'm already at uh, 20 minutes to five. I'm sorry, it's taking a little longer. But basically, this is the only 
the current, um, the currently the only trial involving patients and it's mostly for patients with relapsing remitting MS, aggressive relapsing remitting MS. I was involved in this bid MS trial and it's also a multi-center perspective uh, trial, but the difference is it's incorporated, it incorporated some of the most advanced or most effective DMTs that were not available when Dr. Bird started that uh, MIS trial. So this one is including the Ocrevuses and the Lemtratas and the, you know, Casimtas uh, and Tysabris and all of those drugs that were not around when the other trial started. So it is, I was the principal investigator for this trial in Minnesota, so I was involved with it. And we did the second trial. So the actress Selma Blair, which some of you might have heard that she underwent a stem cell transplant, she was the first one to undergo the transplant uh, by with, with the Cleveland Clinic. And the Cleveland Clinic is the principal, the Dr. Um, Jeff um, Cohen is the principal investigator for the whole trial. So he did Selma Blair. And we in, in Minnesota did the second transplant. The patient did very well. She was a job, uh, she was an elementary school teacher and, and she did great. And she was 50 years old. So I was very happy to see that she did well. And uh, in conclusion, at this point, you know, we, we know that it works. We know that it can have better outcomes than with disease modifying therapies at least with the ones that were studied before, such as Copaxone, Interferon, Gilenia, Sontaisari, et cetera. We're still waiting for the results of the BIT-MS trial to see if HACT is better than Ocrevus and Lemtrada and you know, some of those newer drugs. But um, the issue that we're having is that this is mostly for relapsing, remitting, and aggressive relapsing, remitting MS, and meeting criteria is extremely hard. I will tell you that there are, or there have been a couple of clinical trials with HACT or bone marrow transplant injected directly into the intrathecal space, meaning for secondary progressive MS, there's, there's been one phase two trial that happened mostly in some sites in California. And I'm in the process of um, starting a clinical trial for bone marrow transplant in patients with secondary progressive MS. So this is not gonna be taking blood and giving chemotherapy. This is gonna be, we take your bone marrow out, you know, and then we cultivate those cells, make them grow, make them stronger, and then we put them back. But instead of putting them back in the blood or in your vein, we're gonna give them to the patient inside their intrathecal space, which means imagine a, a spinal tap but instead of us taking fluid out, we're gonna give you the stem cell transplants. And some of those patients that have undergone this type of transplant are reporting improvement in secondary progressive MS. I cannot tell you the name of the company. I cannot disclose things any further because I have a non-disclosure. I have to sign a non-disclosure, but I can tell you that hopefully in six months or so, we will be enrolling patients for the transplant for secondary progressive MS. And I'm gonna stop so that I can give you time for um, questions and answers. This was the team in Minnesota, which was amazing. And this was my trip from Minnesota to Miami with four dogs in the car. So thank you for your attention and um, I'll be happy to answer questions. All right, um, so we're going to start the questions now. If you want to uh, stop sharing your screen, Dr. Nelson, so that everybody can see you. Of course. Um, thank you. So we're ready for our questions. If you have a question or comment, you can ask it using the Q&A button in the app. It also allows you to send your question anonymously if you choose to do so. You can also ask your question live by raising your hand. If you'd like to do this, please raise the hand button or press star nine if you're on your phone. I will call on you and at that time you can unmute to ask your questions. And I'm aware you guys were asking questions during the presentation, so I'm just going to take it as they were coming and I will do my best to get to everybody. So Dr. Nelson, the first question is by Lynn John. I'm so sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Uh, how secure are stem cells for MS? Secure in, in the way um, 
I'm not sure what they mean by secure. Um, as I said, you know, it's a, it's a procedure that is, it can be very dangerous, a lot of complications and a lot of things can go wrong, but if things go well and, and for the right patient, it may mean not having to undergo treatment again, okay? But secure, I mean, nothing is safe and it's, a, it's, aggressive, it's an aggressive procedure that requires chemotherapy. So hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, Bruce is asking, viruses stay in the body, but HSCT kills immune cells, but not viruses. How does that affect HSCT recovery? Well, um, I guess the answer will be, um, I'm trying to I'm trying to think of what the, the patient is thinking about. Okay, yeah, we cannot eliminate the viruses for you for you from your body, but remember we're resetting the immune system to have a different profile and not be programmed to attack your body, right? And so also we give people antivirals and antimicrobials at the beginning of the trial, at the beginning of the transplant to make sure that they can fight them when their immune system is recovering, once it gets back to normal, you know, then they still need to be somewhat careful to exposure to new viruses and new bacteria. But the predisposition of the cells to attack the, immune, the, the brain and the spinal cord potentially came from an exposure to Epstein-Barr virus. And even though we cannot eliminate that, we can eliminate those cells that were pre-programmed and replace them with good cells that hopefully are not pre-programmed anymore. And so they won't cause the damage. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, Nicolette is saying, I've been attending seminars on stem cell transplants for about 15 years and it still isn't mainstream. Are there stem cell transplants where the patient is just insected and I'm sorry, injected with some stem cells without all the risks included? Well, no, the answer is no. Um, there, is, there are places such as cell techs in Houston that will tell you that it's safe, we're gonna take your cells out and then you can fly to Cancun and we'll put them back in and, and then you'll be walking again. You know? And the truth is that it's not true. They did not do their homework. They did not do the research. And, and I, I can understand the frustration of, yeah, 15 years we've been doing this, you're right. It's been a long time, but the reason we need to be very careful is exactly because we don't want people to die when they're doing this, right? We, don't, we want everything to go well. And I feel like as frustrating as this can be, you know, doing the clinical trials and doing it carefully is gonna protect people in the long run, but I haven't heard any good outcomes from people that go say to Israel or China or Mexico or anything, you know, and they just get a stem cell transplant, they don't really get any better, but you're gonna pay $50,000 for something like that that seems easier and you're not gonna get any better. So, you know, we're, we're, we're not quite there yet, but we are making a lot of progress. And I, I hope that, you know, that we can reach a lot of people um, in the next few years but I can, I can, I hear you with the frustration that things are not happening fast enough. And the reason they're not happening fast enough is because they're dangerous and we need to protect you from very poor outcomes. Right, thank you. Esta is asking, what is the age range of the participants? Are those over 65 included? I'm very disappointed in the lack of studies for seniors. You're right, and, and actually, you know, the MS community is, is kind of talking more about, let's do trials on people with advanced MS, let's do trials in people older than 65, we need that information. So I wanna reassure you that we're aware that, you know, we need to do better. And yes, in, in general, the age ranges are, or the age span that we usually um, choose to, for a clinical trial are, 18 to 55, 18 to 60. But I'm hoping that in these trials for secondary progressive MS, we're gonna get, you know, it's gonna be a little higher than that. Now, the reason that they don't want, um, or that they choose in general not to go above 50 or 55 is because as you know, you know, as, as we age, our immune system 
uh, or let's not say the immune system, our body in general cannot undergo chemo chemotherapy that easily. And that, and as I said, this is, for example, for the beat MS trial, it was it was eighteen to fifty five, but the the chemotherapy was really really rough on my fifty year old, as opposed to if you do an eighteen year old, you know they're going to mm -hmm. breathe through the chemo. And my son had cancer and he was 28 and he was fine. He didn't get that sick with the chemo, but then you take a 50 year old and it's really, really hard. And sometimes the complications are, are, are difficult more or more, more uh, severe, but I agree with all of you. We need to see how people above 60 do with this, some of these treatments. The question is, are you willing to take the risk? Right? Are you willing to enter a trial if you're more, more if you have higher chances of complications and dying than someone that is 40? And that's really going to be up to you because we can create create the clinical trials and we can tell you you can die from this. And the problem is that you know that at the at the time of being enrolled, you're going to think. No, it's, it's going to be okay. You know, I want to try it and, and I want to get better. When if, if things go wrong, it's going to be a very different story, right? So right. I think sometimes the, 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 um, the IRB, you know, the, the, the committees that protect, uh, protect the, the, the people that were enrolling, it's called the protection of human subjects they tend to be very hard on us, the investigators, and try to protect you from something going wrong. So sometimes our hands are tied and they're like, no, you're not going to do this in somebody that is 80, 80 years old. That would not be safe. And so we are sometimes limited by what these committees that are supposed to protect you, uh, you know, are, are they want to do. So it's, it's a difficult situation. It's a difficult situation. Right. Thank you. Levi is asking, what is the timeline for the BEAT MS study and results versus more current DMTs? Thank you. Um, I believe they're still enrolling. And so we're not going to see any results for some time. It started because of the pandemic. It was supposed to start in 2020. And it ended up really starting enrollment in 20, I, I want to say 2021, late 2021. So it was delayed for about a year and a half. And um, I haven't seen any any results in some of the uh, meetings. I was to the I went to the meeting in February, the, the main American meeting, and I, I didn't really see much. So it may take another year or so. Thank you. Robin is asking, it looks like this may reverse damage. What changes were in mobility were seen? Well, as, as I um, showed, remember we talked about the walking, the 925 foot walk that got better in the HACT group and they, it got worse in the DMT group. So yes, yeah, so people were able to walk better. Okay, and then the EDSS got better and that includes in you know, all kinds of mobility in general. Thank you. Bear is asking, where do you need to live to have these procedures? Is it if you are fortunate enough to live in these areas where they are doing this? If you go on the um, clinicaltrials.gov, and I went on it and I didn't really see any options because a lot of the studies are outside the US. But if you go on the, uh, let me put it on the chat. Um, I put it for you, don't worry. <laughs> So if you go there and you find the beat MS and out also is a website for the beat MS trial. So if you Google beat MS, you can find all the sites that are all over the country. So I believe there are 21 sites in the country. And what I would suggest you do is to talk to your uh, neurologist. If they're not familiar with the beat MS trial, have them refer you to an MS specialist in an academic center or have your neurologist look for the nearest beat MS trial uh, site. The only problem is that, like I said, the clinical, in the inclusion criteria is, is, is difficult. For example, you have to have a relapse in the last year and, an, and a new lesion or an enhancing lesion in the past two years. So at least evidence of activity twice uh, I want to say one and a half years apart, something like that. So 
Um, so the uh, FDA doesn't really want to allow for us to use stem cell transplant in people that have mild disease or moderate disease. They want very aggressive disease. I, I don't think that's right. I, I think they, sh you know, they should allow us to do it in people that are not significantly or, or have very aggressive disease, but, um, but they, they are limiting those treatments to people that have very aggressive disease. So it's not easy to qualify. And if you have progressive MS, you're not gonna qualify for the beat MS, but you will qualify for the secondary progressive MS trial that we're doing eventually, hopefully in six months at University of Miami. And it's gonna happen also in New York, the secondary progressive a trial, a bone marrow transplant in secondary progressive is going to happen in New York, it's going to happen in Miami. And those are the only two sites for now because we're still in the process of organizing. Thank you. And just a heads up, Dr. Nelson, we have about four minutes left and quite a few questions. So to everybody, we'll try to do our best to get to all the ones we can, but thank you for asking all of them. Uh, Derek is saying, I've been told progressive relapsing isn't an actual diagnosis that is recognized. However, I have been mentioned of being PPMS and PRMS positive. So what is the percentage of effectiveness in either type? We don't have studies in PRMS because it's so similar to progressive MS. Uh, and that's only, you know, the progressive relapsing MS is only 5% of the population. So that's a person that is mostly progressing throughout their life and maybe had one or two relapses and very similar to primary progressive MS. So I would say it's probably, they probably respond better than someone with pure primary progressive MS. They probably respond to the treatments better because they have a little more inflammation in the pure primary progressive. And I hope that helps. Thank you. Terry is asking if I have secondary progressive MS, is bone marrow treatment recommended more than HSCT? Yes. Okay, simple. Uh, Elizabeth is asking, so will the bone marrow transplant study be starting in six months include chemotherapy as well? No, just the bone marrow aspirate, which is a procedure in the, in uh, like a, you have to go, well, it's not a surgery, but you have to go under anesthesia to a certain degree because it's going to be painful, And but no, no key. Okay, thank you. Levi's saying, is HSCT the best or most promising treatment on the horizon? I believe so at this point, yes, but we have to confirm that it's better than Ocrebus and Ventrata and Casinta and all of those new treatments. So thank you. I would, I would say, I would bet that it is, but mm -hmm. I don't know for a fact. And everyone is different, right? I'll just ask uh, two more questions. So Sandra is asking, can stem cells from cord blood cells that have been banked be used? Well, if they're your own, which I doubt, it's easy for them to be a good match. But if they're not your own, then you will have to be compatible. So, you know, I would say if you're having a baby now, it will be a good idea to save those, to save that, those cells, mm -hmm. because maybe in the future, if that baby has any medical issues or that person has any medical issues, it will have those cells for him or her, but for a different person, they will have to be compatible. Otherwise your body may reject cells that are from someone else. So that's a completely different story when you're getting a transplant from you know, someone else. It's a completely different story. And they also asked if there have been any trials using these cells rather than stimulated cells. Uh, not that I know of, but I know they're coming. So we we are, I know that Dr. Richard Burt is starting to look at embry embryonic stem cells, meaning from a fetus, but because in California, apparently things are a little more loose and they can start looking into those things but um, that's what he's focusing on now. Thank you. And uh, Lynn John is asking, what is the cost of the stem cell therapy? I believe it varies between 100,000 and 300,000, but it's a one-time cost. And, it, and in some cases, it, it was covered by the insurance. In the case of the BDMS trial, 
it was uh, covered by the trial. So the patient wouldn't pay anything. I want to say, I'm glad that somebody brought up, um, I was thinking about Dr. Burt, and he's actually doing a trial right now uh, with comparing, I believe, acrylizuma versus stem cell transplant. And he's at Scripps La Jolla. So you may want to uh, reach out to Scripps La Jolla and see if, if you qualify. He hasn't advertised it though. So, but I know that he's, he's in, enrolling. Dr. Burt is now at Scripps La Jolla in San Diego and he is, I believe, still enrolling for the new clinical trial. Ocrelizumab or rituximab versus stem cell transplant. But that's for relapsing, remitting MS again. We don't really have any options for uh, HACT for secondary progressive or primary progressive. Why? Because it did not work. Okay. Uh, do you have time for just one more question? Sure. Uh, okay, so somebody asked Ms. Coleman, any supplements or vitamins that we can take to boost the B and T cells? So think of it this way. You don't want to boost the T and B cells. Your B cells and your T cells are overactive. They need to calm down. So what can you do? What I can tell you that I tell my patients to help with progressive MS is take alpha lipoic acid, alpha lipoic acid, 600 milligrams twice a day. That helps with repair, with remyelination to a certain degree, okay? I, I also want you to take omega-3 fatty acids. That's, those are the building blocks of myelin. So you want to eat good fat, like salmon fat, omega-3, okay? You don't want to stimulate your B cells or your T cells with echinacea or elderberry or anything like that. You don't want to stimulate them. You want to calm them down. And the other way to calm them down is by not being anxious and stressed out, as silly as that sounds. Being stressed out and anxious makes your B cells and T cells act up. Okay, so exercise, vitamins, relaxation techniques, meditation, and do everything and anything that you can do for repair. One of my favorite things to recommend is Mediterranean diet is the only diet, the only diet that has been shown to decrease brain volume loss. Remember I said, as we age, we all lose brain volume and in MS, it happens even faster. Your brain ages faster. Well, the Mediterranean diet, just Google it, Mediterranean diet, lots of fish, lots of olive oil, lots of wine, that is going to slow down you losing brain volume. Okay, there are a lot of things that you can do to stay you know, to not let the disease get worse. And, and some of those things will help. I wish I could stay with you a little longer and I'm very happy that you had a lot of questions. Maybe the uh, MS Foundation can do this again in uh, six to eight months and I can give you an update on where we are with, you know, if we're starting the trial. So thank you again, all of you. And, uh, and if anybody wants to come and see me in Miami, I'll be happy to see you. Well, thank you, Dr. Nelson. That brings us to the end of our time. If you missed any part of this conference, it has been recorded and will be available through the MS Focus Facebook and YouTube channels. Reply to your registration email for information on how to access the recordings or sign up for our newsletter to learn about upcoming events. Our next teleconference will be Tuesday, July 11th at 4.30 p.m. Eastern with Dr. Ben Thrower, who is going to be discussing pain and how to manage it with MS. As you leave the conference today, a survey will appear on your screen. We ask you to please take a moment to give us your feedback on this program and your suggestions for future topics, so we can be sure to provide you the best and most meaningful programs possible. Our sincere thank you to all our attendees for your questions and especially to our speaker, Dr. Nelson. Thank you so much for the time you spent on a Friday evening with us to share this information. Goodbye everyone and have a great weekend. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.